I'm on Haysborough Beach, North Norfolk. I've been walking a timeline through history. I've taken the scale of one millimetre equals one year. I've walked almost a kilometre so far, and through all of that time, the dominant technology was based on stone. But I haven't yet reached the flag that represents today. I started with the earliest human footprints found in Britain, 850 metres back in that direction. And I'm standing right now at one of the most important discoveries in history, the use of iron, a revolutionary new material. This metal would herald a new age, the Iron Age, that would transform the landscape, the way we live and the way we fight. Britain, an island where history is part of the landscape. Where human feet have walked for a million years. In this series, I'm going to explore Britain's distant past, from the earliest evidence of people in Britain, right up to the moment that everything would change. I'm going to discover how our ancestors survived from hunting and from gathering. I'll discover the technologies they used, the knowledge that they passed down, and the traces that they left behind. I mean, it's mind-blowing. Yeah, a million years ago, right here, there was a family of people with mammoths. This is the story of ancient Britain. Get exclusive documentaries and ad-free podcasts with top historians. Watch on your smart TV or mobile device by downloading the History Hit app. Like all of our prehistory, the Iron Age is shrouded in mystery. But clues can be found if you know where to look. This beautiful landscape is Puzzlewood, deep in the heart of the Forest of Dean. But this is not a natural landscape. This is a post-industrial landscape. This, these features were formed by the picks of miners who came here first in the Iron Age looking for iron ore. Because the iron ore here is exposed at the surface, it was possible to reach it using open cast mining techniques, the earliest form of iron ore mining. When you look at a face like this, you see this like crazy paving effect. That's the result of the tips of the miners' picks when they were searching for iron ore here. Today, of course, they're very weathered over time, but that is the lasting testimony to the presence of miners here. The rock here is mostly limestone, but you find within it little patches that look rusty. That's a remnant of the iron, and you can see all the little pick marks here quite clearly where miners had worked this area. Probably they found a seam here and followed it through. It could well be that this area was known long before the discovery of iron because you also find in the rocks here hematite, red ochre. And it could well be that people were collecting that in this area for ceremonial purposes thousands of years earlier. But around 800 BC, the knowledge of how to work iron reached Britain, probably spreading from Europe. Soon, iron-rich rock became a very important resource. Actually, iron is a very abundant mineral. So that, coupled with its great malleability and workability and, and, and toughness, made it a, the super metal that would power us into the industrial age. To find out more about why iron is so important, 
I'm meeting up with blacksmith Joe Tyler. Joe, there's the man I've come to see. So I reckon you, um, you would have been one of the most important people in a community in the Iron Age. Yeah, well, hopefully, for anything from a tool for everyday use to, to weapons to fight battles and trade with. An amazing material, iron. It is. It's so versatile. We still even use it today, of course. For and it's the... abundant. And it is, yeah. Yeah, very, yeah. Iron wasn't the first metal to be worked. Copper and gold were discovered much earlier. Later, bronze, an alloy of copper with other metals, was found to be superior to pure copper but iron proved to be even more useful than bronze. It can do the same things, but you can do more of it. It can hold a better edge. It's slightly stronger. It's, it's, it's almost like something from the gods themselves, I would imagine at the time, you know, something it's almost like a godly material because they've been, they've been able to survive and trade and work with this bronze all this time. Then this iron comes and then, and then they start working it and thinking we can do more with this. And yeah, it just, it seems like it must've been a godly material. It would have brought a refinement to everything else too. Yeah. So the woodworking gets easier because it's easy to keep it sharp. It's not a hassle to, to, you're sharpening bronze, you can sharpen bronze, but it's quite complicated to do it by comparison to steel. With these advantages, Iron was able to revolutionise almost every area of life, from fighting to farming. Come on, let's make something. Okay, so we've got some flat bar here. I'll just bring them up to a heat. So although we're using a slightly more modern uh, version of a forge, it's the same principle. What's not changed in thousands of years is you need an air source, um, basically a chew or air pipe to come through and a pit. And that's what I think I like that's what's really attracted me to join, uh, go into blacksmithing, is the fact that thousands of years, not a lot has changed, and the tools definitely haven't changed. Uh, the tongs yeah. and the hammers are all still the same. And the smell and the sound is the same. Yeah, it I mean, is. It's, it's almost like uh, you're, you're stepping back into history yeah. when you're working um, sort of traditional equipment and tools. This one's looking all right. Yeah, you're... Shall I have a... Yeah, have a, have a little bash, go for a tapered point. But it's like, uh, so when you're, when you're looking at um, apprentices in the past, you would have someone on the bellows constantly, and um, which makes it a little bit easier for, for the smith. Um, at the same time, though, it, it might seem like a bit of a daunting task to be on the bellows all the time. But as an apprentice, you're, you're getting to witness the secrets that other craftspeople are trying to find out. And um, I think that's quite special to be, to be, be, to be able to witness um, your master craftsman at work and you're assisting that and you're learning the techniques for you to then possibly take it on after. It's really interesting. It's a bit, it's a magical process. It is, And yeah. of course, the great thing is that you can easily reuse things. So a tool one day breaks, you turn it into something else. Exactly. Anything like a rivet or a nail or a hook, it's all useful. Yep. I'm making a sickle, an important tool that allowed farmers to quickly harvest grain for human consumption and grass for animals. I'm just tapering this down to make the tang, that's the part of the blade that will fit into the handle. So at the moment, what, what we're gonna do is, we're gonna just make the tang, as Ray said, and then we're gonna flip this round and we're gonna tape, do a long taper. And then once we've got that long taper, we'll do it to eye and then we'll start bending it around to sort of form the sickle hook. Yep. The key to making a good sickle is getting the curved blade just the right shape. I'm hammering in the bevel of the edge of the sickle. It gives it its, its triangular cross section, if you like. And uh, this is a right handed sickle, and I see Joe's making a left handed version.
then it's just a matter of adding a wooden handle. The last little job. Ah, lovely. And one of the most important tools for the agricultural societies of the day, the sickle, for the harvesting of their, their crops. Fantastic. Joe, it's been brilliant working with you today. I've it's been an absolute thoroughly, pleasure. thoroughly enjoyed it. It's like it brings, it brings the past to life. And, um, you know, I think what, what, what I'm, I'm left with is this feeling of how capable our age Britons were and how, you know, their curiosity aroused by this material it must have been fascinating. Yeah, it must have been. And I, I wish I was there for the first time it was done to witness that, sort of that magic. Uh, but at the end of the day, I'm very fortunate to do this and, and sort of almost live in the past a little bit in my own way. And this is a, a little bit of an experiment really, but it feels good, it's got a good balance. You know, iron is an amazing material. Until iron came along, if you wanted to reshape something, you had to melt the the, the bronze down and recast it, which means making a mould of the right shape. But iron, you could take this out into the field. I could do so today. I could go and cut a crop and see how well it worked. And if I didn't think it was quite the right shape, I only have to go back to the forge, reheat it and reshape it. It's malleable. And then I can try again. So it gives you the opportunity to experiment and to perfect tools. This would therefore provide a revolution in agriculture. Plows would improve. It was easier to clear the ground with uh, iron axes, which are more easy to sharpen and to maintain. And with that, of course, came an increased demand for the land itself, for agriculture. People would start to defend their property. And what would they look to to provide their weapons? Iron. Now, we see the development of the iron spear, the iron sword, the shield, and the organization of culture where farmers and communities band together to defend their property. And evidence of those conflicts can be found throughout Britain in the extraordinary structures left behind from the Iron Age called hill forts. This is the spectacular Morven Hills and I'm heading for one of my favourite places in Britain. There's a bracing wind up here. There was a frost last night, but by golly, it's brilliant. It makes you feel alive. Literally breathtaking in every way. <laughs> Fabulous. I mean, this has to be your archetypal hill fort. You can see the ramparts of the past, mysterious features in the British landscape. And this is British camp, aptly named. It's the most incredible view from up here. Absolutely stunning. I've been up this hill a few times over the years and it never ceases to amaze. It's just brilliant. I think the first thing that strikes you when you come up here is the impressiveness of the earthworks. There's a lot of work to excavate all of this and of course the ditches would have been steeper and deeper and it's believed that they had a palisade going around them of, of stakes in some way. These would have been very impressive features in the landscape. They give a, a wonderful view across the landscape, but they also impose a presence on the landscape. They define a territory. This is our place. And it gave the tribes that, it, that used these hill forts the opportunity to control the trade and movement through their areas. There were major hill forts and minor hill forts. And you can see how large and impressive this is. Some of them have evidence of battles and some don't. 
But there again, sometimes you have an enemy that's so powerful you don't want to go to war with them. To find out more about the Iron Age tribes who constructed this fort, I'm meeting local archaeologist Aidan Smith. What do we know about the culture of the people? Well, the Iron Age used to be just characterised as, a, as a, a warrior culture, and that's all they thought about. But consider the gold that they were making, the gold talks. It, it's, it's fantastic, the artwork that they were creating. It can't just be a, a warrior class. There, there was certainly a warrior elite, um, but it, it's not just based on war. Out there in the environs, we've got huge evidence for farmsteads. Just on Wells Road, not, not long ago, that last year, we found a production site, a pottery production site. So there's a wealth of evidence around the site, not just on the site. It's best to think of, a, of hill forts as being associated with the landscape, not separate from it. I mean, they're, they're basically a, a, a power hub exactly. within the landscape. Exactly. So would there have been a chieftain here? I think there would. Um, and at some point, a chieftain had this made, had this created. Um, I think he'd probably only visit seasonally because if, if he's the chief of the Dubuni, he's got quite a, a territory to control. Probably come here in special festivals. Um, they are up here at some time in the year and everyone down there is physically looking up at them. So it's just instilling that hierarchy again into society. Um, it may well have been a place where the Druids uh, lived as well with the chieftains, again, seasonally because they're doing other things in wetlands. They're, 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 there's lots of ritual activity in different parts of the landscape in the Iron Age. The design of the ramparts and the defences is obviously is steep. Yes. It was a very good defence. Yes. But it was also quite maze-like. Exactly, yeah. The very interesting thing about most hill forts is they generally have uh, one very convoluted entrance with lots of left and right turns. Um, now, that would be a fantastic defensive structure uh, on the, the gate, you may well, instead of having the, the timber wall, you may have had a stone wall with a, a timber bridge going across the banks either side so you can throw stuff down. Um, timber gate, very hard to get through. But then the south entrance, there's practically nothing. It's almost a straight line in. So I think the, the defences or the, the complicated entrance is, is actually uh, more important the way you walk through it. Fascinating. I mean, and what, what of you? I mean, if you were uh, yeah. the chief, you could look down on all of your subjects. Absolutely, and absolutely. See was, so I guess it would have been more wooded, perhaps, with, with small S Small, small farms. farmsteads, yeah. I mean, the landscape isn't, isn't that different, really. We'd have had more elm wood. Um, but it's not a million miles away for, from what it was. Obviously, the, the field and enclosures would be very different. Dotted with farmsteads, as you say, and you'd be able to see... This, this aspect that we, we are very familiar with, double ditch enclosures and the Iron Age settlements within those, and they would be all across the landscape. And of course, most of these little hills that you can see would have a little hill fort on them as well. Britain has over 3,000 hill forts. This is one of the most spectacular. Aidan, th this hill fort is really quite something because this isn't soft chalk that they are quarrying I mean, this is limestone. Yeah, yeah, with, with antler tools as well. Yeah, it's phenomenal, isn't it? But I, I, I doubt that they were using antler tools on, on rock like this. I think like earlier periods in history, they were probably setting a fire underneath the stone, on the stone, and then throwing water on it for it yeah. to crack. Right. It's impressive, it's a lot of work. Yeah, I've Maybe... often wondered where the stone goes. Where does the stone go, yeah. yeah. So that, that, then if you're thinking about the, the, the major entrance, and having a stone wall around it, it starts to make sense. We haven't got evidence of it now because the medieval... They would have pinched it. Exactly. So all that's visible now are the earthworks. But once, the fort would have contained buildings such as roundhouses. Only faint traces of those structures now remain. This looks like uh, the, the site of a roundhouse. Oh, this, this area this little here. little area here, um, entrance facing southeast, which is normal for, for roundhouses. So if, um, I, if I've, am I walking around it now? You're walking around you're, you're inside it. I'm inside it. You're inside it. So it's it. quite a big roundhouse. Yeah, and you're just reaching the edge now. So this is it? This is it. Yeah, I can see it better from yeah. here. Fire in the middle. Yep. So people all around, 
doing different functions, we know that they had different parts of the roundhouses to do different things. It's hard now to imagine what these buildings were like, but fortunately, I don't have to. This is Butza Ancient Farm on the South Downs. Here they've reconstructed a number of Iron Age dwellings based on evidence found in hill forts. Showing me around is their resident archaeologist, Claire Walton. Claire, how are Hello. you? Hi Ray, welcome to the Iron Age. Would you like to take a tour of some of the facilities? I would love to. You know, I haven't been here for probably 30 years, so I'm really excited. So this house, uh, the original archaeology for this house is just south of Salisbury. Okay. And it was a very famous example of roundhouses excavated. The archaeologist who led the excavations was a gentleman called Bersu, and he was very famous for proving for the first time that the people of prehistory didn't actually live in holes in the ground, which is what people used to think. We find that unbelievable now, but that was the narrative in the 1930s. We always underestimate the sophistication of our Yeah, I, I definitely agree. So this is the lovely entrance to the building with these huge big doors, and people have wondered whether this was actually an agricultural building and that the doors were so big to allow the entrance of carts. It certainly allows a big draft in, yeah. But if you go inside, one thing you'll notice is that it's quite dark because there isn't a hole mm -hmm. in the roof. And so the smoke from the fire is drifting up into the roof and percolating out through the thatch rather than being drawn up very quickly through a hole. And of course, you can imagine what would happen if you did have a hole and the fire was being drawn yep. up into the roof. We're very lucky we have never accidentally Had set fire. fire to any building yep. here. Touch these something would go, with yes. They yes, would, they would. would. So welcome to our, the biggest of our roundhouses here on the site. Wow, it's quite an impressive space, isn't it, as soon as you come in? It's very beautiful. It's hard to imagine living in this space as it is now, but archaeological evidence would suggest that larger roundhouses like this one would have been divided up. So the peripheral space around the edge of the building would probably have been divided up by panelling, it has yeah. been suggested. So each of these could have been discrete areas for doing different activities or, or, or different families. An even. alternative suggestion has actually been that you could keep animals yeah. in that area around there. And in one of the houses I'm going to show you in a minute, the phosphate evidence suggests that animals were stalled inside that building. It's very interesting. So it's not just people inside but, these houses. I mean, I've, it, I've had the privilege to work with cultures around the world that, that inhabit spaces similar to this. And I've seen in, in Venezuela that there were people who lived in multi-families in a space just like this. Mm -hmm. um, and then in other parts of the world, in Africa, I've, I've seen houses that are very dark where livestock is kept inside the house and it's kept dark to keep flies from coming in. Well, people well. often talk about the smoke in these houses, and this isn't a good example because the smoke is going way above our head. Yes. But in some of the smaller yeah. ones, yeah. the smoke ceiling's very low and it's yeah. literally just at head height. And people often say, how could anyone have lived in here? Mm. Or there's no way they could have had a second floor because it would have been in the smoke ceiling. But yeah. what we're forgetting is that it could have been the lesser of two evils. So what would you rather have, yeah. the, the biting insects or the smoke? Um, and the evidence of, so take Ötzi, the ice mm. man, now his body has been examined in great detail and they've concluded that his lungs were quite badly damaged Ingested. by smoke. Yep. And now he wasn't necessarily uh, some unique person, so we can extrapolate from that, that that's kind of representative yep. of people's lifestyles in and, the past. And it's one of the things when, when uh, people encountered the Inuit, one of the things they found, they had a lot of eye complaints, which they attributed to the smoke in, in their houses where they were burning soot from uh, seal fat lanterns mm -hmm. and things of, of this nature. Well, the other thing I've heard is that they often talk about how short beds were. And we have a Neolithic house here on site. And the evidence from places like Scara Bray, other mm. Neolithic sites, is that the beds were very short. And ideas have circulated about, oh, so you could, you know, you could sleep half sitting up, so you could jump up should your enemy approach. Uh, but I actually think that when you look at archaeological evidence, it's far more likely that people's lungs were quite badly damaged by smoke and they had chronic lung conditions and perhaps you physically had to sleep propped up in order to be able to breathe better. Wow, that's that would kind of make more sense to me. Yeah. Um, it's not a very pl pleasant no, thought. No. Each house at Butza is based on the remains 
of an actual structure excavated somewhere in Britain. So come on into a house which is enigmatically named CS1. CS1. Oh, this <laughs> CS is standing great. for Circular Structure 1. So this house comes from Danebury Hillfort, Danebury being near Salisbury and it had a large number of buildings. They think that people started building houses and structures up there around 600 BC. So inside here we've got furnishings arranged um, in ways that some of the archaeological evidence might suggest uh, that this was a kind of representative layout. So over in this corner here you get the cooking and food preparation area and as you move round in a clockwise direction, you come to a seating area, potentially where the men may have spent their time. And as you move round here, you have a sleeping area. So the argument has been that it follows the movements of the sun. Mm -hmm. And that's a very logical, sort of functional argument. But I think actually this, the archaeological evidence has been selectively picked and chosen to support that argument. So. We're, we're not 100% sure. It makes sense that probably culturally people would have certain arrangements in their home which were recognisable to others because if you have it, you need to be creating a system which yeah. other people understand how to fit into I your think, system. I think that's very common. I yeah. mean, it's the same if, if you're living in a tent today, you, you organise it in a certain way. And that's true of nomadic cultures and other tribal cultures around the world. There's a specific layout to the home. It, it is in our culture too, is that the, the, we have the hallway, don't we, where we leave exactly. our, our outdoor clothing. So it's fascinating. Give me a picture of what we know about a family unit at that time. Well, it was probably structured in a small nuclear family, but of course they would have had extended sort of kinship relationships. One of the things that's very interesting about hill forts and the idea that people started moving to hill forts in the Iron Age is that that represented uh, a change in society and uh, the in an increase in high status living. So perhaps a new culture of kings or very high status people. When we come to a place like this today, everything looks a little dull and faded. But actually, yeah. life was more colourful than that. Yes, absolutely. Uh, it's such a shame that this is what happens to stuff in your home when you have smoke like this filling your house all the time. But we know if we look at some the very rare archaeological evidence, but it's preserved in bogs or lakes. And if you look at some of those textiles, uh, archaeologists have been able to very carefully discern what the original colours of those textiles were because they can look at the dyes that were used and the colours are unbelievably and exquisitely intense. But very interestingly, uh, I read about an experiment a few years ago where they took a brand new piece of dyed, uh, I can't remember if it was linen or whether it was something woolen, but they dyed it using natural pigments and then they put it into lake conditions to represent what was found archaeologically. When they removed it eight months later, it had gone from being the most intense red colour to being a sort of muddy brown colour. And that says it all. So the world would have been vibrant and people were wearing beautiful colours. Fascinating, yeah. isn't it? Life was hard. I mean, what was the life expectancy during the Iron Age? If you made it past the age of about five, you were onto a winner. You were probably going to survive into adulthood. So the first five years of life, and that's true up until probably the Industrial Revolution almost, that until the age of five, you could succumb to a vast range of infectious diseases. But if you got that far, obviously your immune system must have been strong enough that you could have fought off a lot of other illnesses. And at that stage, you could have expected to live at least into your 40s, but many people lived on until their 60s. So to take the average age and say that everyone was dead by 40, it's not, it's, it's not a very good way of looking at it because really you just had to survive the first five years. And there's lots of evidence of people having lived into older age. In contrast, there is also lots of evidence, if you look at Egyptian mummies, that many people died very young of things that we'd never imagined dying of now. So I don't even like thinking about it because it's so horrific to imagine, but dental abscesses yep. got lots of people. Um, and if you look at what the quern stone is made of and how you grind grain on a quern stone, it's your teeth. easy to understand how you're basically filling your grain with 
with stone as you go, which you would be baking into the bread and ingesting. And as you grind down the enamel on your teeth, bit by bit, you're exposing the, the inner parts of your teeth and therefore exposing your teeth to infection. I'm, I'm going off the Iron Age quickly. <laughs> <laughs> People always say this about the past and how wonderful it might have been, but I say modern medicine has transformed the world we live in yeah. in ways we could never imagine. Absolutely right. So all of the glorious aspects of the past and imagining living in a beautiful space like this might be offset by the, the risk of some simple things like working with uh, a flint tool. What happens if you cut yourself when you get an infection? Mm. There's no way of, of dealing with that. So people must have been made of strong stuff. They must have been made of strong stuff. It's fascinating. A huge amount of work has gone into these reconstructions, taking the best available evidence. Even so, there's much we don't know about how Iron Age Britons lived. One of the things we need to always remember about experimental archaeology is that it can only ever show us what could have happened, not what definitely did, did yep. happen. So these interpretations here are interpretations. Yes. Of course, these are logical interpretations because there's only so many ways that you can interpret a circular building yep. um, and each has some variable inside it. So the one that we've just come from, it had an outer wall of planks set in the ground with a roof on the top. So there's lots you can see by a process of elimination. It's great. You can work out really what the building could have looked like. It's fascinating. Yeah, so it? come inside and we'll have a look at this one. Beautifully thatched. It's a brand new, pristine thatch. This house actually came, the archaeology comes from Wales. It's called Molly Gardy. And in its first phase, it was a wattle and daubed walled structure. But very interestingly, later on, there was a, a second phase for the building where they replaced the wattle and daub walls with stone. So in the archaeology, obviously, the remains are much more obvious because there's still some stone in situ yeah. in the excavation. Uh, but that's, you know, that shows that these buildings might have been around for longer than we think. Oh, this is beautiful. So this house has had a bit of a makeover recently, which I think does make a big difference. So you saw the, the thatch from the outside, but you see on the inside what the thatch looks like before yeah. it becomes completely blackened by smoke. Not dark yet. No. But I mean, I guess there's no evidence for painting on the walls, but it's beautiful and it looks like it belongs. I mean, why not? Absolutely. So this is what we wanted to do is give a representation of what m might have been. So we took some motifs which had been found in other objects from the Iron Age and we transported them onto wall paintings. They're beautiful. Yeah, aren't and they lovely? I, I mean, I look at these, des these motifs, these designs, and we, we gain an insight into a culture that's gone that was special. It was complex. Well, look how incredibly detailed some of them are. Oh, incredibly they're, complex they're and beautiful. beautiful. And they suggest a, a cosmological view of the world yeah. because you see animals caught up within some of these motifs. It's fascinating. Yeah, they're really it's lovely. really interesting. And, and what's lovely is that they're not all symmetrical. I love the asymmetry of mm -hmm. some of these designs as well. It's beautiful. It's so mysterious. I just wish we knew more. Of course. Doesn't everybody think how amazing it would be just to be transported back in time to to, to walk into to that world or just be invisible and walk around watching everybody. Yeah, It'd be awesome. Be amazing. Well, you can almost do that here. That's what's wonderful about Butza. It's, you know, you feel as though you, you have made that journey back in time. I really like reconstructions like this. I mean, it's an amazing place. I can only imagine what it would have been like. I've worked with tribal cultures around the world that live in a similar way to the people who would have been here back in the past. I can hear children's voices, uh, visualize them running, maybe hear in my mind the whinnying of a stallion in a paddock nearby because these were people who valued horses. It's fascinating. There's so little known about this period in our history, but one thing's for certain, our ancestors at this time were incredibly sophisticated, artistic, creative people. And so, with the Iron Age, I come to the end of my journey through Britain's prehistory. It's a great thing to do, to walk a timeline like this. 
you can see the vast distance in history during which we use stone tools. In contrast, the Iron Age lasts little more than 800 years, less than a metre on our timeline. If I take one short step forwards, I come to the Roman invasion of Britain and the beginning of recorded history. Everything that we are certain about in our history, because it's written down, is found from this period forwards to the modern day in only two meters travel. An astonishing short period in time compared to the great length of our heritage. Thanks for watching this video on the History Hit YouTube channel. You can subscribe right here to make sure you don't miss any of our great films that are coming out. Or if you are a true history fan, check out our special dedicated history channel, historyhit.tv. You're going to love it.